Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the moon. I am your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray, and today I am joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. Um, and today we'll be discussing uh, quite a few things, actually. Uh, the future of staking uh, with the University of Wyoming. Um, we're talking about Mercado Libre accepting Bitcoin for some of the purchases and much more. So stick around to hear the news. Um, well, uh, Ricardo, Jerry, uh, before we do uh, get into the news, how are you boys doing today? Uh, how's everything going for you? I'm doing all right. I'm a little bit under the weather. I came down with a, a bit of a cold. No, no COVID plague, but a little bit of a cold. Nice. Okay. Glad to hear it. What about you, Jerry? Uh, feeling pumped. Uh, my team, Manchester United, actually um, passed Roma yesterday, so I'm feeling pretty high right now. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know they played a game. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the English one, so I really should know this. Okay. So I know, I know. Nobody watches the Europa. You know. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, to be fair, I barely watch football. I'm a Forest Green fan and they're in League Two. So, you know, and the only reason I'm a fan of them is because it's kind of funny. I would see them play and <laughs> they're like an all vegan, all solar powered stadium, like proper, like their kit's made of bamboo. It's like they're brilliant. They're all green. Forest Green. But um, yeah, anyway, this isn't a Forest Green uh, promotion uh, podcast, so we'll, we'll move on swiftly. Um, but yeah, essentially t today we're not joined by any guests. We're going old school um, and we'll just be doing, um, yes, yeah, some talking about some news and attempting to get Jerry pissed off, essentially, is the, is the aim of the game today. Um, so <laughs> yeah, without further ado, Ricardo, kick us off with your first news piece, please. My first news piece is called mass adoption looms as south america's second largest company accepts crypto payments and it's about mercado libre which is like spanish craigslist it's a classified ad site where you can place ads to sell stuff and buy stuff from other people um, it also includes property and also cars and stuff but the current acceptance of bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that Mercado Libre is adopting is in regards to property. Um, they're doing a test, like a pilot program, where they're going to allow customers to sell houses, condos, vacant lots, um, commercial real estate, and plots of land in, in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, Santa Fe, and Cordoba, which in those places, you will be able to buy property with Bitcoin. So far, their, their pilot program, it seems like it's going to be kind of successful because when they did their webinar, they had over 300 real estate agents partake in the webinar to learn how it would all work. I guess it's just going to be like another payment option. Right now, you can already pay in dollars, uh, Argentine pesos, or Brazilian rays. So nice. um, yeah, Bitcoin will be another option. The reason no, it's ahead. significant is because Argentina has had huge currency devaluation. In the last year, their currency has lost like 42% of its purchasing power due to inflation. And they've also been putting in increasingly strict capital controls to prevent people from leaving the peso while it's being devalued. So um, I think right now the limit is you can only buy like $200 worth of uh, dollars or euros or Bitcoin like officially to, to get out of the peso so you can kind of protect your wealth. And um, because of that, crypto adoption in Argentina is, is really, really high. Um, people have been using Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as a store of value and a way to get around capital controls. Oh, it makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I because I know Mercado, I'd never, I never knew there was Mercado Libre. I only know Mercado Livre because that's what it's called in Brazil, right? Like it's, uh, if you go on the website, it's exactly the same but it's just Livre rather than Libre. So I didn't know Libre was a thing, but obviously that's like the original and then Livre is just the Brazilian version. Um, so yeah, I, I, I knew the website uh, well enough from my time in, uh, when I was in Brazil. Uh, and it's yeah huge basically that they're going to begin accepting Bitcoin, even just on this kind of pilot version sort of style of just for the properties. It's still huge. Um, you know, it's just quite a, quite a big deal. Uh, and it kind of runs in, in, in sort of line with um there's, I think it's in Rio, or I can't remember now, but there's a, there's a Brazilian um, estate agency that uh, has for years, if not, I don't know if it still does, but at the you know, going back a year ago and for, for a while, they'd accepted Bitcoin, I think with a discount as well, actually. Um, so it's like 2% off of paying Bitcoin. Um, and what it does is pretty cool, because like, for example, if I want to go buy a house in Argentina or Brazil or whatever, I have to obviously, uh, pay, first off, pay an exchange rate from my pounds to 
the local currency, which is going to be a whatever percentage. And then I also have to pay the capital control sort of taxes and things as well, which in Brazil are incredibly high. And I don't know about other South American countries, but so if I can just go and be like, right, I want to get a beach house in Brazil or whatever, or, or Argentina, I can just go and pick one up with Bitcoin. It's going to save me a hell of a lot of money and effort and time to just pay a transaction fee of what, you know, five bucks or, you know, I know it's been higher recently, but not much. So um, yeah, big deal, big deal. Uh, and really indicative uh, as well for South America in general. What about you, Jerry? Have you got any thoughts on it? Um, I think um, what, what this means uh, for me personally is that it, it kind of like, uh, it's not really about, I think they accept in Bitcoin is, it's like um, validation or it just proves to the fact that, you know, there is, there is kind of, there's now a sense of acceptance you know, of Bitcoin as not just a store of value, but as a medium of exchange. So for them to come to the point where we say, okay, we are cool with accepting, you know, Bitcoin right now, you know, no fear of volatility. They, they are not comfortable with Bitcoin. I think that 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 says a lot about, you know, the kind of confidence that people have, you know, has bestowed on, on a currency that was, you know, born barely, you know, 11 years ago. So, um, you know, more grease to the elbow. Sure. Yeah. Even with the volatility, if you would have put your money in Bitcoin instead of pesos, you'd be doing a lot better than you would have if you would have put your money in pesos. Makes a lot of sense. Um, and yeah, I guess it's um, good news all around. I say you're right, dead on right with the whole uh, situation with kind of like moving from just just a store of value to more of a medium of exchange. Like, you know, if it makes sense for you to buy a property in Bitcoin then uh, over fiat, then well, that's great you know, in the first place. It, essentially, it is making it um, better, um, which we already knew anyway in the first place. Yeah, yeah, for them to want to come to the point of accepting Bitcoin, that means more, there are a lot of people actually hold, you know, Bitcoin because, you know, they don't have, that means they don't have to go to the process of, you know, buying, you know, buying Bitcoin, then using Bitcoin to pay. They probably own a lot of Bitcoin. I think that is a very bullish, you know, um, sign. You know, people, they must have heard the fact that people talking about Bitcoin, people own Bitcoin, they say, Okay, people want, probably they've had you know they've had customers want to pay with Bitcoin and not be you know able to you know and that's and I thought why don't we just accept Bitcoin? It seems everybody wants to pay with Bitcoin, so why don't we just you know accept Bitcoin you know going forward? I think that's you know, pretty bullish. Yeah, something that's cool as well about like uh, this is obviously a, a large corporation um, that's doing this, but something that's cool is like the impact that this can have for smaller businesses if they start accepting Bitcoin, like a lot of smaller businesses because. Imagine it's like um, we, had a, we had a guy on the Spaces talk uh, yesterday um, from El Salvador, and he was talking about how there's this Bitcoin beach. Uh, I don't know if you've seen like links or anything going on here, but Bitcoin beach, there's like two beaches that are kind of, they're trying to make it all kind of Bitcoin. And obviously the idea is that like, hey, if there's a, a big enough like local town or village or whatever that kind of lives, literally lives on Bitcoin, like accepts Bitcoin, you pay, you hold, whatever, everyone is using Bitcoin for everything in the stores and everything like that then what you can do is like um, kind of make yourself this kind of haven for digital nomads who have Bitcoin, right? Like people are going to want to come for the novelty aspect, but also because, hey, like, okay, I can live here and this actually is my like dream area. So you're kind of incentivizing a huge growth for your like local area, right? Like Monaco did something like this years and years ago by removing tax and that brought a lot of people into Monaco. And now look at it, it's a huge wealth network and bustling, right? Well, places can do this by instead of re removing tax, just accepting Bitcoin nearly everywhere in that area and accept and being accepting of it. So it's pretty cool to see how it can change the local community. In a place like El Salvador, where there's lots of poverty, people can be incentivized to switch when they see that the residents of this village are a lot more prosperous than the surrounding villages. Yeah, it's a really good point. Uh, and this is the thing, it can make a big impact for areas that are less well off at the moment and hopefully can help them become more well off. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, and I say, I know we've kind of diversed a bit, like, but actually it is kind of indicative of what's to come, hopefully that like, yes, large corporations are taking it, but really the value is where smaller communities can start to accept Bitcoin and that's where it can really build in smaller businesses. Um, but yeah, I guess to, uh, to do a switcheroo on the news, um, away from Bitcoin a little bit here, uh, my news piece uh, this week is about, it was, it was one that kind of surprised me, actually. It was uh, kind of interesting. It's about the University of Wyoming. So it's, uh, the, the title is called Your Future at Stake. Uni of Wyoming allocates $4 million to staking three coins. Um, essentially, what's happened is um, the university 
has basically got together uh, or appropriated uh, $4 million um, from their strategic investments uh, and projects account um, to operate and maintain nodes and staking pools for no less than three publicly tradable cryptocurrencies. So, Which shit coins are they? Well, <laughs> this is a thing. So immediately there's not a proof of work based coin. So it's definitely not going to be Bitcoin and it's definitely not going to be Monero or whatever. Um, so I, it doesn't say, right? I, I don't think they've decided yet. But it's clear that that is going to be happening. Like, they've made it very clear it, this is happening either way, basically like it or not. Um, but yeah, I, it's one of those things where I kind of, I like it. Like I, I like this actually. Um, whether you're like, you know, all Bitcoin or, or not or whatever, um, it's a step in the right direction first off if you're like a if you're a hardcore bitcoiner um but also like i mean part of me just says well why don't they just start up a mining like or why don't they start just holding bitcoin right like it'd be just as easy um why are they staking but um so i don't quite get that side of things i'm not sure if you guys have any thoughts there on like why they chose to do staking rather than just buying and holding uh, maybe because it's more of a scientific experiment to them maybe that way I don't know. Well, maybe they're thoughts. getting kickbacks for investing some of the university <laughs> money in Tezo. <laughs> <laughs> no allegations are being made here. Just FYI, it's just just speculation, everyone. Just speculation. <laughs> I was waiting for something like this. No, but like it's. Uh, I don't know. I just I, I, I besides that side of things. If, if we're all imagining there's just honesty here, right? It's just honest. I, I just can't quite understand. I'm a little bit puzzled. Yeah, I just don't. I mean, sure. As I say, it just surely it is easier to just buy and hold whatever cryptocurrency you believe, right? Like, if it's hey, if they are all like BSVs and then they really believe that's the future, why don't they just buy and hold that, right? Like, or I don't get why they're just staking. I, I don't know. It's, I'm a little bit puzzled, um, to be honest, uh, quite frankly. But hey, it's better than nothing, right? Like, at least they're going somewhere in the crypto direction. Brings no, I think this is a case of like when you have normies that work on the school board of the university and they hear all these buzzwords about crypto and proof of stake and then they see these FUD articles about uh, Bitcoin's environmental devastation and how the seas are going to boil from proof of work and stuff like that. Um, that I think they're probably thinking that proof of stake is, is the future and that Bitcoin's like uh, more antiquated uh, because of proof of work and and the uh, negativity surrounding the energy consumption so maybe maybe that's why they're going proof of stake over trying to set up mining or holding i think i agree with lawrence there might be some um some of these might be from uh for experimental purposes so uh but it still bugs me why didn't they just buy uh, bitcoin mining rigs um start mining bitcoin you know but i think like uh there might be some you know um i wouldn't call it kickbacks but some you know financial motivation because you know Shit coins tend to give more rewards if you stake. You know, probably they were probably thinking, ah, you know, like you said, uh, uh, piece proof of stake or DPoS is the future. Uh, in ten years' time, all the coins we're going to be probably um, getting from you know our stake is probably going to make us, you know, probably going to make the school a whole lot richer, our investment a whole lot, you know, um, profitable. But you know, it. I, I'm I'm really curious to know what kind of you know coins stuff they're going to probably stake. I'm thinking, um, since you mentioned the ones that are tradable, so I'm guessing they're going for the most liquid um, proof of stake coins out there in the market. So I'm thinking probably Tezos, um, EOS, and um, probably if, big if, Ethereum does move to proof of stake because it's all smoke, um, smoke and mirrors right now regarding you know, Ethereum's transition to proof of stake. So I'm thinking right now, um, um, liquid, you know, liquidity is quite okay. Popularity is there. Um, same for um, EOS. So uh, we're probably thinking how much we're we going to make, you know, from you know staking because these coins do, you know, uh, like it's to me it's like a Ponzi scheme. But you know, I don't want to get into any arguments. But um, they're probably thinking how much coins they're going to get from staking, you know. So it might it might basically be some financial motivation, really. I suppose. I mean. This is the thing, right? This is where it comes to, because obviously anyone who's like new to the space, it can be really tough to work out because there's always people telling you that like one consensus mechanism is better than the other for X, Y, Z reasons, right? <clears throat> but when it comes to, well, I mean, in, in my opinion, I should always preface, when it comes to decentralization um, and a fair, more fair system, 
uh, generally, I would think that proof of work would win on, on those sort of metrics. And I guess if you look at all the different consensus mechanisms, there's a lot of them, obviously. Like, you know, um, but if you look at, for example, proof of work and proof of stake, the two kings, I guess, at, at present of the, the, the two most popular ones, um, proof of stake is generally uh, faster and generally is easier to scale um, and is generally better for the environment. But the problem is, you can't, what people don't really realize is like, why, why is that the case, right? Like something's obviously got to be sacrificed for those gains. Um, and that's, I think, something that people don't ask themselves enough because, because you could say, okay, proof of work is clunkier and worse the environment, right? And that's why I'll go for proof of stake. Then you could say, well, actually, in that case, if, you, if this is your key goal, right? Like, well, actually, proof of stake is kind of, if you're just going by scalability and speed and environmentally friendly, you can say well, proof of stake is crap compared to, uh, I don't know, um, well, XRP or Stellar's Federated Byzantine Agreement consensus mechanism, because that thing is way faster, way better for the environment, and scales even better than proof of stake. But hold up a second, what you're doing is you're kind of just sacrificing a level of centralization along the way. Um, so proof of stake is usually more centralized than proof of work. And then if you go to the Federated Byzantine Agreement, <laughs> consensus mechanism, sorry, it's a word for, from XRP and Stellar, hey, it's super fast, but it's even more centralized generally, I should say generally, than a proof of stake would be. So I think people need to realize it's like a scale and there's all the elements on it of what you want your currency to be. And proof of work, if you're coming from a perspective of having a, a truly decentralized currency that is secure, um, then Bitcoin is the winner, in my opinion. Uh, of all those. And I'm not sure I explain myself perfectly, but I guess what I'm trying to say is like, there's always a trade-off is what I'm trying to say. Uh, there's always a trade-off. I can't wait till we see some, some attacks on some chains, some proof of stake chains, because uh, last year they were attacking things like Ethereum Classic uh, with 51% attacks uh, by renting out um, hash power to attack the blockchain and do double spends and stuff like that. So I don't think anyone's actually attacked a proof of stake blockchain yet, but I would love to see it happen in real life just to, you know, for the science experiment of it. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess there's obviously that, uh, that element of like, why not just to see if it can be done and how it can be done. Um, I guess uh, when it comes to attacking, yeah, because this is interesting. It's like, um, I think I brought this up a few weeks back when I was looking at Algorand and like, I don't know if I did bring this up actually in the podcast, but like my concern there was that, I think it was that uh, they, in the in the, the whole basis of, because Algorand seems, for a proof of state cryptocurrency, seems like really, I mean, when you read into it, and I, and I do uh, have a little bit of it, I'll be honest. Um, it seems, seems cool. Like it seems like, okay, this is a really good idea. It's fast. Everything seems to check out. Until you then realize when you're reading it that like the entire assumption for their entire white paper is that over 66.66% of the nodes are honest. That's a lot of honesty to be assuming. So all you need is like 35% of people to be like, to be evil in, uh, when it comes to your nodes and that's it. It's quite a, you know, it's nowhere near solving the, the Byzantine generals uh, problem. Uh, Cause you're kind of assuming that an overwhelming amount of people are honest. Um, so that kind of, pissed me off for one of a better phrase um and there's all these concerns there. so yeah it'd be interesting to see how easy some of these proof of stake uh blockchains are to or networks are to attack uh, i do think at at 2.0 would be one of the prime candidates for, for the university to be staking to if they actually successfully pull off the the switch the, yeah. then, then they're, pro they're probably going to be investing uh in probably 223 or 2048 because i don't think um 2.0 point is coming out anytime soon sorry everybody <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I read an article from Vitalik. Um, I don't know when he posted it, but I read it about a week ago. It must be, it must be older than that. But um, on, he, on why he thinks proof of stake is far superior to proof of work. For, for his use case, so for Ethereum, it is. Um, because you need, on the theory, you have to have a lot of pace and a lot of scalability for that to actually do what it's supposed to do. Because right now, Ethereum is actually really a failure. Um, if you look at its original goal, it's nowhere near the original goal. Like it's succeeded in a sense, in some way, in a sense that it's created, it has created dApps. Yeah, there's been tokens made on it. Okay, it's, it's been, it's got some kind of utility, arguably, but it's, it's failed when it comes to its actual goal. So it needs speed and scalability, whether it sacrifices uh, decentralization or not, it needs to go that next level. So for them, they do need, they need something else. Like they can't just survive on proof of work. They'll never get to where they want to get to. Um, yeah, I'm totally cool with them, you know, moving to proof of stake, you know, piece of shit or whatever you know, <laughs> it is. 
as long as they are honest about it, you know, if they are sacrificing you know, some centralization, they should own it, you know, not, 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 you no, know, start drawing false equivalence between Ethereum and Bitcoin, why Ethereum is just as decentralized as Bitcoin, despite, despite the fact that, that if they do eventually move to, you know, um, proof of stake, then all that is lost. So as long as they're honest about it and, you know, and not begin to draw, draw, you know, just, you know, begin to spit out, you know, pseudoscience and all this mumbo jumbo, hey, they're cool to do whatever. Go ahead. Sorry. How do you feel about the the attention on on Binance's smart chain right now, and how um, Pancake Swap has flipped Uniswap, and, and the um, it looks like there's a large migration of shitcoinery over to Binance rather yeah. than Ethereum. There is because of the gas I totally, fees. I totally love it, dude. I totally love it. it. Makes good banter material. Like it feels so good when you have to troll the, all the Ethereum maxis on Twitter because they. You know, whatever the BSC trolls are doing to Ethereum maxes today is what they've been doing to Bitcoin, you know, since um, 2017. So um, all the banter, I'm up for it. I'm all for it. Let's go. For me, like, because this is the thing, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of more of a fan of Ethereum than I am of Binance Smart Chain. Um, reason being like, hey, you've got nine validators isn't it or something it's not many i think it's nine validators or it's around that number tiny amount of validators all of which realistically are cz let's be honest um so it's basically just cz's chain um i mean i'm being a bit over you know exaggerating a little bit here but it's essentially the biggest centralization of all time and then if you look at like i don't know if you guys saw about this but um pancake swap uh i'm not gonna say it but it is i'm not gonna make any allegations but in my eyes is essentially a scam um, because it's like they've got this situation recently where, and this is where it gets ridiculous to me. I can't believe I'm saying this, but people were buying syrup and and cake in order to get syrup. I know it's ridiculous um, that we have tokens called this in this day and age, but they were buy, people were trying to buy syrup. And essentially what was happening was they were losing all of their money because there was a problem with the smart contract code, right? This code that's been verified by some fancy company and there's an issue with it. So people are losing all their syrup. So they were doing nothing about it, pancake swaps. People complaining, and when they complained that they lost all their money because of the shitty contract, they were getting kicked out of Telegram group, banned, all this stuff. So they then used the syrup voting or something, whatever they've called it, to try and like vote to say, hey, this needs to be fixed and we need some of our money back. And uh, the pancake swap team, instead of going along with that, said, no, you have to have cake now to vote. <laughs> so it's like, so now these people can't vote on their own fate. Basically, they've lost all their money because of a shitey smart contract, and now they can't vote it. They can't have any vocal thing about it within these groups. So essentially, I'm not going to say it's a scam, but it's reminiscent of a scam, is is what I'm saying here. Um, so I'm a big not fan of Binance Smart Chain right now, um, and there are a that, ton of shit um, coins on it as well. I agree with that. If you're going to call Pancake Swap a scam, then you have to call Uniswap a scam, for real. But for real. hey, like, yeah, isn't it a direct fork? <laughs> like, like, let's let's be honest. If you're going to call Pancake um, Swap a scam. The Unifork and Sushi Swap, they're all scams. You know, probably, I'm, 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 <laughs> listen, I'm not going to have to give props to the Cake Swap team because they stuck to their guns. You know, if this was Ethereum, they'd probably have, you know, do some rollback shit or, you know, try to just, you know, do something that, you know, that goes against the ethos of, you know, decentralization decentraliz and all of that, you know, what we seem, what we, you know, what they claim to stand for. So Cake Swap, they stand to their guns. You know, this is the, these are the rules. You need you need to vote with your thing. Not really. I disagree <laughs> massively. Code, code, I don't I don't agree that code is law when it comes to like uh, this situation. If they cocked up, because it clearly they, they, it's not the user's fault. It's their fault. They messed up the smart contract. They shouldn't yeah, be. Uh, yeah. but really, but look, look at it this way. Um, if if for instance, if people, if someone, if if for instance, if, if there's a you know fatal flaw in a Bitcoin and people lose money, who are you going to hold responsible? Uh, the, the thing with that is like, okay, you say that, right? Who am I going to hold responsible? No one, because I know that I'm buying a coin that has no central authority. I mean, I could arguably hold Bitcoin Core responsible, though, couldn't I? I mean, let's be honest. But like the thing is, in the early days of Bitcoin, because we're talking early days, right? Like Pancake Swap is relatively new. In the early days of Bitcoin, security flaws were exposed. And there was that situation where someone pissed about a Bitcoin and didn't, wasn't there like a 800 million or something like that Bitcoin that appeared on the blockchain? And, and Satoshi had to dial it back and fix it. That, that's the thing, right? In those situations, they were list, people were listened to when they got screwed by the Bitcoin uh, network being inadequately built because it was very early days yeah, and well, it was dialed back and sorted out. Yeah, Uniswap is worth at least, um, I think, 2 billion or 1 billion, at least, um, let's say, above 500 million. 
pancake swap is probably the same amount. So it, it, I think you really can't compare. Uniswap swap is big. Pancake swap is big right now. They're pretty popular. You know, they settle lots of transactions. And you, you, the argument could be that you know they they have a team. They have you know team that works and you know updates keep keeps up smart contracts. But if we are going to you know go back and say okay, we are going to follow the ethos and, and all that you know ideal idealism idealistic um um what decentralization stands for you know what they what we are here for then everybody's responsible for whatever happens to them you know whether interacting for instance let's look at look at what happened to parity you know people lost money in parity and regard of where where people who lost money in parity in the, in the parity exploitation where they you know compensated i can't really remember no, no they weren't no, remember they were trying to petition Vitalik to do another rollback, rollback uh -huh. and he said, this time we're not going to do it? Yeah, it's so it's same thing. If PancakeSwap says uh, they are not giving you, you, if you want to vote, I'm sorry you lost your cake, but if you want to have any say in this, you have to vote. Really, I, I, I really see no problem with that. Too bad that they lost their funds, but it is what it is. You invest, you, you put your money in, a, in an ex experimental, you know, uh, projects and this is what you should, you should expect. That is why we always say buy Bitcoin, leave shit coinery alone. So you do not have to hold any because things like this happen. You have you wouldn't have anybody else to blame but yourself, <laughs> really. So if you want to say pancake swap is a scam, then Uniswap is a full blown uh, um, what's the uh, Theranos level scam. Oh man, I just, I just, I, I don't agree because my key point here, right? My key problem is that there is this voting ability, okay, with the built into pancake swap. So you, for you to use your like tokens or whatever it is that you have to vote on like proposals, right? So they were doing that exact thing that was built in. So they were this decentralized pro thing, right? They're like everyone votes and they voted. So people all like 1.1 million, I think it was some ridiculous amount of people voted to sort this out basically not necessarily dial things back but for some people to be like remunerated by community funds or whatever it was so they voted for that the pancake swap team chose to ignore that and then suddenly change the rules on how voting is done after the vote was done say no no, no we're now not doing that we're going to just change it to this now it's like well what like you know that is completely centralized and is completely different to what uniswap's done that's my problem that's what i'm trying to get it's like an example um there was the the Initial hack where you know Vitalik did say, uh, "Hey, everybody, stop trading. Uh, can you guys stop trading now?" <laughs> then there was the case of the priority ha priority hack. Now these are rules, two rules for two different sets of people. They did roll back for one; they didn't do roll back for the other. But then that's the thing. They changed the, they changed the rules, didn't they? Yeah, but I, I, I mean, okay, I'm not going to go ahead and say what Vitalik did was right or wrong. Right? I'm not exactly a massive fan of Vitalik. The, the point you're bringing up about how they changed the rules of the voting. Um, is a valid point. That's kind of like why the outcry happened with Steemit when Justin Sun took it over and they ended up forking to a different project in Hive yeah. because they kind of did the same thing where they undermined the, the established governance of the blockchain. Yeah, that was a huge issue for me as well there when they did that. I remember reading about it. I was just like, that was when I immediately was not like a fan of Justin Sun at that point. I was like, this is unbelievable. And I remember Binance were kind of involved. There was a little bit of, they were kind of involved at the beginning of that as well, a little bit. And I don't know how much, so I'm not going to, again, make any allegations, but um yeah well i'm gonna take it that i beat you jerry i'm joking i'm not really i'm not really <laughs> I, think, I think blockchain governance is kind of a buzzword though like i kind of like the the gridlock of bitcoin and the you know how if users want to do a user activated software they can decide to run a, a different version of the protocol on their nodes as the form of governance i think uh these blockchains like tezos that have tried to implement governance into them have all been massive failures as far as executing it yeah, well, I, I mean, the ability for people to fork Bitcoin is essential, right? Like, because um, humans are always going to want to experiment. They're always going to want to try and like create something better or different or whatever that fits their use case. So the ability to fork Bitcoin is essential to what Bitcoin is. Like, uh, otherwise it's not open and, and free and permissionless. So, yeah, um, I think the fact that, you know, enables users to have their own voice, it's very, very important, essential in the, in the game theory of Bitcoin. Well, yeah, okay. Well, I say we can all agree on that point at least. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I, yeah, I found that frustrating with Pancake Talk, that that change suddenly, and, and as you say, kind of similar to Steam, it's uh, deal that occurred. Um, I guess. Well, what would you, we'll we'll play uh, we'll play the game uh, that we uh, haven't played for a little while now because we've had such good guests on. Um, so I haven't I haven't wanted to waste time. But um, we'll play a fun game quickly, and then uh, we can talk about a bit more news before we we kind of crash out uh, of the pod. 
Um, so yeah, I will find it because I've just lost it. Here, here it is. So yeah, uh, this week we have um, the true or false uh, news headlines game. So again, it's not cryptocurrency related. Um, but there's three, um, and one of these is false. Um, and to be honest, I can't remember which one is false because <laughs> I did this a few days ago, so I'm going to have to work it out myself. <laughs> but I'll have a look. I haven't, I haven't written it down. But so I don't really know what it's going to be, but we'll find out. Um, so number one, hangovers get easier to deal with as you get older and new study claims. Okay, it's not that sensational. But, uh, number two, Dulux uh, refuses to apologize after making fun of Spurs, Tottenham Hot Spurs, the football team. Uh, immediately after being named their new sponsor. And number three, m &S, uh, supermarket here, in legal claim against Aldi, another supermarket here, over Colin the Caterpillar cake trademark. Yeah, guys, those are the three. So you've got uh, hangovers get easier to deal with as you get older. Uh, That's a false one. Story Whoa. one is false. Okay, all right. I will all say right. That. When I was young, hot. I could drink and it, it didn't affect me. And now I can't even drink because I get too, too damn hungover. From my personal experience, I can only agree with you there, Ricardo. Uh, okay, so you're going straight in, hot off the press with number one as false. Okay, I like it. Confidence, ballsy. Well, okay, so Jerry, um, do you want me to run over them again, or are you, have you already made a decision as well? False, because uh, I'm not much of a drinker, but I agree with Ricardo. Okay, so you're both going for I Article 1. Okay, right, right, gotcha. Um, well, I'll just quickly see which one actually is fake. <laughs> um, let's have a quick look. Okay, right, gotcha. Okay, right, so um, you're both wrong. FYI, uh, it's not false. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. This is why I put it in, because I thought it'd be like a swerve. I was like, ah, it's not the one you think it's going to be. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this was bizarre. Um, I don't know quite the specifics of the study, but essentially the study that has been carried out has claimed um, that, yeah, hangovers get easier to deal with as you get older, which is complete rubbish. I mean, geez, I used to be able to get absolutely smashed, and then I'd be able to kind of have a half hour of not feeling that great, maybe another half hour, and then I was off for the day, like back in uni, you know, studying. Now I have like two days of hangover after I have maybe six or seven drinks. Like, you know, it's a nightmare. Um, but yeah, it says here, they believe that a decrease, decrease in pain sensitivity as we age helps us cope better. Mm, not so certain on that one, but... Um, Apparently that's what they uh, that's what they find, and also younger people tending to binge drink more regularly than older generation was a, a factor that kind of meant that they uh, they were kind of more used to the the hangovers. But yeah, anyway, a bit odd. Um, the second, uh, well, I should say the third one I'll do because that's another true one was that yes, um, so Marks and Spencers uh, in the supermarket here is in a legal claim against Aldi, another supermarket chain that's from Germany, but is here over a Colin the Caterpillar cake trademark. And this has become very serious news in the UK. Um, it's actually, it became huge in the UK. It was like a big thing um, because it's ridiculous first off, but also because they basically, what happened is like, they've got this, <laughs> this is ridiculous. They've got this chocolate caterpillar cake uh, in Marks and Spencer's. They were the first ones to do it. looks like a chocolate caterpillar. It's very tasty. And um, all the other supermarkets have basically stolen the design and it looks very similar. They call them like Connie and Colin and Crammy and all this stuff. Um, and, Aldi's one is the most similar, I think, in look to the one originally. Now, Aldi has not backed down from this at all and started this kind of like Twitter campaign and they're doing a load of memes and some of them are absolutely hilarious, I will admit. And it's got huge. There's like millions and millions and millions of people sharing these things and it became quite a big deal. So that was, uh, that was the third one. And the false one, okay, so it was Dulux refuses to apologize after making fun of Tottenham Hotspurs immediately after being named their new sponsor. Now, actually, uh, they, did, they didn't They did refuse. They apologized. Uh, so Dulux is a paint company. I don't know if anyone listening, they might not know. Um, so they, uh, yeah, essentially, they were named uh, a new sponsor of Tottenham Hotspur pretty much like the day before. And then on Twitter, uh, they were taking the mick out of, uh, out of Tottenham and their performance. Um, and they had to, obviously, they deleted the tweets and they've done an investigation into who actually was doing it. But I thought it was quite funny that they sponsor this team and then the next day they're just taking the mickey out of them on, on Twitter. Um, but they I think it's quite funny that Aldi forked the Caterpillar cake. Pre hey, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> like, so you've got, you've, m &S is the Bitcoin, you know, and then you've got Bcash is maybe Tesco's version. You've got BSV. Um, so yeah, they did a fork. Yeah, that's just fair. Um, so that's the end of the uh, the segment. So that's the that was our game segment uh, finished. But yeah, I uh, well, none of you win, I win. Fantastic point for me. Um, but this yeah, is our I first, get, right? 
Yeah, it, normally it, it's me versus Jerry. Exactly, yeah. and uh, I am. Yeah, I am lucky here. I was one of the. I've managed to to win on this one. I guess. Yeah, there's a news piece. I don't know, Jerry. Did you have any news you wanted to discuss at all? So you you guys did remember that the Central Bank of Nigeria actually banned banks from actually <clears throat> getting involved with cryptocurrencies, right? Mm. So um, today, uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria announced that they fired um, the board of directors of a major bank. Now, <laughs> yeah, here's the funny part. Uh, one of the reasons, I think, me personally, I think it's, a, it's the major reason why they got fired is because, aside from the fact that probably we, you know, the bank was you know, performing badly um, and probably getting close to the brink of you know, total collapse, one of the reasons why they were fired is because the bank was actually trading cryptocurrencies. <laughs> Like it's so it, it, it's it's so funny because this this bank actually had you know people's accounts closed for you know buying and selling cryptocurrencies. Now they themselves started trading cryptocurrencies with customer funds, dude. Like it's so in my brain. I I couldn't stop laughing. It, it, it's it's crazy. Like I'm I'm pretty like uh, when I told Ricardo, Ricardo did say um, that you know it's pretty sure that a lot of banks are you know stacking up on you know Bitcoin and probably. They may be getting involved with shit coins too, and just putting up, you know, funds for the media. But they're probably stacking, you know, right now as we speak. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that if you know, if if people start probing, or if you know, there's an, an, an like an inquest into, you know, uh, the bank balance balance sheets, don't be surprised to see Bitcoin and probably some shit coins. Like you see the university doing, getting involved with you know, proof of stake. I'm pretty sure that so many financial institutions are probably thinking along that same lines. Why don't we mine shit coins? You know what I mean? <laughs> what 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 how, how could it do? Since they were using customer funds, do you think they closed the accounts of the customers whose money they lost uh, trading shit coins? That, that, that's, and that's then said possible. you were buying crypto, so we had to close your account. <laughs> but they really closed it because they lost the, the deposit money trading shit coins. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's so good though, isn't it? <laughs> We don't know if they actually lost money, but I'm thinking probably why they were, you know, probably uh, fired is because probably they gave the go ahead for them to, you know, probably invest in, you know, shit coins. Who knows? They might have invested in Dogecoin and probably got, you know, front run in the market. So safe moon, yeah. Again, it's kind of a safe moon. <laughs> but they were probably fired because exactly. they lost money. If they made money, do you think they'd be fired? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's still against, oh, well, surely, because it's against the, well, it's not against the law. I mean, it if must... they made a, a huge windfall, do you think they would have been fired? I think they got fired because they lost money, right? Or no? Yeah, that's, that's the point. I think they got fired because they lost money. But because if they <laughs> actually made some money, they probably had, you know, some good excuse, you know, or probably bribed their way through the whole mess. Probably lost, lost, lost a whole sh you know, shit ton of money. And now they face with probably, you know, probably going on the, on the bankrupt. So they just had, New set of directors. I'm hope, I'm looking forward to see how this plays out. But from what the CBN governor did say, he did say um, they were investing in non-regulated assets that mm. oppose that opposed to the regulations of you know the central bank. And from an insider who told who works with the CBN did say they were investing in cryptocurrencies, but didn't say which. So I probably the last crash probably invested over invested in. Uh, Bitcoin, the other cryptocurrencies, and you know, the market did what the market did. I, I, I'm not sure if you guys remember. I'm, I don't know if we did a part the other day, about two or three weeks ago. There was a major crash from 62 to around 51. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like dude, I, ha I had a bunch of friends that you know were over leveraged. You know, they got totally wrecked. Yeah, like to, uh, a friend of mine lost 1.3 million dollars. You know, so it's possible. <laughs> it's possible that you know. These guys, you know, got into the market at a bad time because I'm probably I'm here's the thing. I'm thinking they've been doing this for long. They have totally been doing this, you know, involved in trading cryptocurrency for a while. And they probably think, man, this is good shit. It's like taking weed for the first time. Like this is good shit. You know, probably got hooked and thinking this is free money. You know, money printer go brrr. They probably got some young, young guns in the in the IT or tech department who says now Bitcoin is the main thing, you know, it's free money. All my all my friends are making money, probably. Probably put in your first million dollars, you know, got, you know, two or 1.5 million dollars. Like, what are we doing, man? <laughs> this one's just sitting here. This one's just sitting here. Let us pull them out, you know. They wouldn't know. After all, we already do fractional reserve banking. So, <laughs> they no wouldn't reason. even know. 
already scamming <laughs> everyone anyway. It's like, uh, well, I bet, I bet they just, they made us money right on Bitcoin and they, and they saw, they went safe moon. Hmm. Well, I mean, it's got the word safe in it, right? Like it's gotta be safe. And then moon, <laughs> well, <laughs> I want to go to the moon. I mean, geez, all right, let's do it, boys. And then they just piled in on this absolute scam that Safe Moon is, FYI. And I'm and I am gonna say that it, it is a complete, yeah. But anyway, um, I I think yeah. On that note, it's probably best to for me to leave it uh, as is. But yeah, it's interesting to see that like the hypocrisy that you know, no, you can't trade cryptocurrency. Shut down. Oh wait a sec, but we're doing it ourselves. And then someone else shuts them down for doing that, essentially, or they get in trouble for doing that. It's quite funny. It's like the bully is kind of like bullying the kids at school. And then the mum of the bully is like, no, you're not allowed to do it either. And then they're like, boof. Um, all right. So, yeah, well, everyone, um, it's uh, it's been great to well, great to talk to you guys. And it's been great to have the listeners listening. Um, if you guys want to have any, any sort of uh, chats with us or feedback or whatever, you can always get in touch on, on Twitter. Um, or you can join our Sphinx chat. Um, there's links on the BitRefill Twitter for that. So I say I will leave you guys now with some good news, uh, some positive news to help your week or day uh, get even better and even more positive after our wonderful positive chat today about uh, cryptocurrency. So here we go. <clears throat> England is soon going to have its first not-for-profit IVF clinic, cutting the cost of having a baby for those struggling. France has proposed a new scheme which encourages the trading of old cars for electric bikes to help reduce the negative impact on the environment. Hideki Matsuyama has become the first Japanese man to win the Masters after four winless years of golf. A man who found $10,000 on the floor in a lost wallet returned it to the rightful owner and received a jar of homemade applesauce in return. Uh, Daimler Trucks is now accepting orders for all electric freight trucks. A biodegradable food wrapping made out of algae and cinnamon has been invented, which appears to tick all of the right boxes for replacing plastic packaging. The first human trials of a HIV vaccine have produced immune responses in 97% of volunteers. And lastly, Guy Fieri's Restaurant Employee Relief Fund has raised almost $25 million for struggling workers. Good man, Guy Fieri. Good props to you, my man. But yeah, I say it's uh, awesome to talk to you guys. Awesome to have everyone out there um, listening in. And uh, yeah, buy Bitcoin and have a good week. Take care.